This episode is made possible by our sponsor, Landmark College, the college for students who learn differently, offering comprehensive supports for students with ADHD and other learning differences, both on campus and online. Learn more at lcdistraction.org. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Camerata and welcome to this episode of Distraction. Mom guilt. I loathe the term. I loathe the concept. I don't even understand where it comes from. As you may have heard in our previous episode, my guests Bethany Johnson and Maggie Quinlan, co-authors of the book, You're Doing It Wrong, Mothering Media and Medical Expertise, explained some of the reasons why women feel this way and where it comes from. So in today's episode, We're gonna talk about this idea of perfection and feeling like you're never good enough somehow and you're not living up to what everybody else's expectations are. And of course, we talk about how the pandemic has affected all of this. Given everything that that you guys know and have studied, what do you think the answer is? I mean, there's this feeling that working moms can't do, feel that they can't do anything right. You know, like they can't get, be perfect at work. They can't be perfect at home. When they're at home, they're worried about work stuff. When they're at work, they're worried about home stuff and they just can't get it right. And I'm like, first of all, I'm not even striving for perfection. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm from the good enough parenting school of thought, which is like, it's good enough. Yes. We'll eat dinner somehow tonight. I'm not sure exactly what time. I'm not sure if it's going to be delicious, but we're going to eat dinner somehow. I'm sure somehow tonight. So yeah, go, go ahead, Maggie. One thing that helps me is, you know, just to remind myself that, you know, the images that I see on social media are just a snapshot of the world, that it helps me to follow mom influencers who are more of an a- activist that sort of align with my feminist ideals. And so there's, you know, people like Chelsea Skaggs, who is an activist for the postpartum experience for women. And so another thing that Bethany and I talk about in in the book, you're doing it wrong, is the whole idea that go into social media, get what you want, and then get out, right? And it's helpful for me if I'm going through a tough time to talk to people who are actually experiencing it off of social media. One thing Bethany and I have realized through hours and hours and hours on social media studying that people are going to social media for health information often because they're in a crisis. And so people are going there because they had a miscarriage, because, you know, they don't know what to do about a rash, because they're going through infertility, because their child has 104 temperature and they don't know if they should go to the ER or not. And so what Bethany and I have have started to do in those moments is this is not the time to give that person advice. Like they don't need to hear, you know, necessarily my advice, but they just are probably asking for support. And Bethany recently started for people that she's seen, you know, saying, looks like you're going through a really hard time right now. What can I do to support you? It looks like you're going to be in the hospital all day tomorrow. Can I send you, you know, $5 via Venmo to help you through a really hard day. Like that's what's probably really helpful to people in those moments that people know what they should do at that time, most likely. And the should is another tough word, but um, so, how, you know, how can we make this a better space? And, you know, to be, to I also like to remind people that it's, it's not an individual problem of why you're going through this, that you're stressed about this. And there's so much more in the structure of our society in the U.S et cetera, that is causing you to be in this situation. And it sucks, you know, and I'll acknowledge, you know, for them that that situation really stinks, but how can we support each other? And it doesn't just have to be women supporting each other that, you know, we need the help of men, you know, in these moments. And there are a lot of really good fathers, but a lot of even the good fathers need to step up and Mm -hmm. take the emotional and mental load. I definitely agree with that. I really, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm really glad you brought that up because my, my daughters, I was telling them that we we were going to be having this conversation and I was telling them, you know, I don't suffer from mom guilt. I was bragging. And they were like, uh, they immediately called me out. They were like, uh, cause dad does so much for us. Like dad is the one who organizes the driving and the schedule. And dad's the one who does all the math homework with us. And dad's, I was like, 
Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Like that, that is true. <laughs> I could not have the job that I have and I could not have the freedom that I have if I didn't have um, a husband who dove in. And I say mm -hmm. that to women all the time when women are like, I could never, I can't take my foot off the gas because if I take the foot off my foot off the gas, the laundry is not going to get done and the dinner's not going to be made and somebody's going to miss soccer practice. And I'm like, that sucks because you know, I strongly urge you to try taking your foot off the gas one day because somehow I've noticed the slack gets picked up. You don't believe the slack will get picked up, but they're like, no, no, I could never trust my husband to do it. So it's a twofer. It's like, I can't trust my husband. He's an incompetent adult. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems that women feel that they must do it all. And so they've never given the guy a chance. And the other problem is that the men have never stepped up to prove that they can do it all and show the woman that they can do it all. So it's a, it's a, it's a bind and it's a bad, it's a bad pattern because we need help. But if motherhood was, was valued, right. Then fathers would be doing that kind of work too. They'd be right? interested if, in it. Yeah. If you didn't just yeah. get lip service, <laughs> yeah. thanks for my breakfast in bed on mother's day. But what I'd really like is paid maternity leave, equal pay and access to childcare. Um, yeah, I, that's a great point, Maggie. I think, you know, um, when women entered teaching in droves, men exited teaching in droves because it was no longer a high status job. This happened with nursing work as well. Um, you know, just ask a man who works in nursing what kind of flack he gets about that from other guys. I think the idea of caring for people and doing emotional labor has been so gendered for the last 200 years that it's it can be considered, you know, not a respectable thing to do. Maggie and I are very lucky to have very involved partners, but even they have been socialized to not see things that we have been socialized from small children to see. So one example is my husband can just steps in like, I don't need to prep him. Like he is their parent. He's not a babysitter. He's a parent, but he still asks me what their Tylenol dose is. And the other day I was like, we're five years in bro. You need to figure out what their Tylenol dose is. Don't ask me this anymore. I am not the keeper of the Tylenol dose. Like, work it out. You know, and he was like, that's a good point. I'm like, you just keep asking me, and I just keep telling you, and I'm being a doofus. Like, go figure it out. Don't ask me again, you know. I'm glad. I'm so glad. that it, Like, that's the answer. The answer is to tell people, like, you pick up the slack. Today, my daughter had a cold, and she goes, Mom, how much of the Alka-Seltzer cold plus am I supposed to take? I said, read it read it. Like, I know you have a cold, but I'm not going to baby you through this. Read the effing right. box, you know? So anyway, I, I like, I love that story that you've told your husband to read the Tylenol. I wish that would make um, universal healthcare or universal daycare available for people too. Meg and I talk a lot about like these individual burdens, like that can make a difference in my marriage, but it doesn't make a difference in the culture raising my children to be disappointed with this dynamic in the next generation and to have no institutional resources to meet those needs should they not have the economic privilege that I have in my family. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I love about your research and that I love about your book is that when you learn the historical underpinnings and context for all of this, it is an eye opener because suddenly you feel less guilty. Like you realize that you are a cog in this big kind of counterproductive system for women. And that I think is very guilt relieving. And it just, you know, suddenly like the dots connect of, of why some of these things are happening. Weaponizing motherhood against women upholds patriarchy, mm -hmm. right? And men can do what they can do because, you know, because of that. And so one thing I've been thinking about is how the father father groups on Facebook and on social media, that if a, if a father will post a health question, you know, about their child, all the dads below it just make jokes. Where if you see the, the women, you know, they think that this fever is is so important that it's going to change their life, you know, forever, where another guy would be like, put the baby in a bath with ice and it'll be fine, you know, but if you compare the, the way the conversations go, you would think this is going to impact the baby and their ability to get into college or, or whatever it may be. And so, you know, paying attention to where the, the blame is getting and how how different choices are con are constructed is, is something that really interests me. I bet. The threshold for women being called a bad parent is far lower 
than it is for men still. And that's an institutional thing. I'm not going to get a good enough paper organizer to work myself around that one, Allison. I think you can agree there, right? We can't, we can't systems our way out of some of these systems, even though using these systems can help me personally feel a little bit better. I will never organize my way around a lack of childcare. No, I totally agree. Of course, I agree with that. But I also would say that nobody has ever called me a bad parent to my face. And so, again, I think this leads back to social media. Mm -hmm. You would never be called a bad parent. Nobody will ever call you a bad parent unless on social media you're picking up cues that say things like that. Like, in other words, out in the real world, yes, there are, there are occasionally the examples of somebody in the grocery store saying something. I, a friend of mine came home once, but again, this is the eighties with a note, it was the seventies, a note pinned to her, <laughs> pinned to her shirt in the winter saying, I need a winter coat that the neighbor had pinned <laughs> to her because again, like who knows where the parents were in the seventies and eighties, but in general, in to your face, people don't call you a bad parent. And so only on social media. <laughs> Yes. They will to your face. That's yeah. my point. That's my point. Yeah. I mean, again, it, it, it circles back to that. that that's a, if, if that is a toxic message, then we need to, I would say, figure out a way to wean our generations off of that. Mm -hmm. Because who needs that toxic message? A good example is Bethany and I just finished up a paper on Amy Schumer. And she asked for infertility advice uh, while she was going through infertility treatment on Instagram. And the comments that people made to her were horrific, telling her she should um, she should just adopt, that she her genes shouldn't be passed on, comments about her husband's autism diagnosis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just these horrible, horrible comments. What was the shop, don't adopt? What was adopt, that? Adopt, don't shop. Adopt, that don't was, shop. Yeah. Just horrific things that, you know, did say she's a bad parent. And for me... You know, I haven't had anybody say I'm a bad parent online, but if I've asked, I had a son who um, he's three and a half now, but around a year, he started to fail to thrive. His weight was not going up. And I asked, you know, any, any advice and, you know, everybody's response was, you know, make him a smoothie or give him an avocado. And although they weren't shaming me per se or telling me I'm a bad parent, but it, can you try to get a one-year-old to eat an avocado who doesn't like, you know, like as if that's, and there's class issues with that. Avocados are expensive. My family has to decide is a $3 avocado or another option. So I, th I think a lot of, a lot of the messages are, although they're not telling people that they're, but avocados aren't going to solve all the world's problems mm -hmm. and they did not solve our problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, thinking about some of the messages and some, some of the ways that it could be in interpreted when you don't know somebody's situation. For sure. A big theme in our book is that targeting, Allison, that you've been perceiving and that you've heard mothers talk about um, again and again in the book. We say, instead of putting the target on the individual, ask why the system has an individual in that place. What are the systems and institutions in play? But it's so much harder. It's so much easier to say, just do this or like, don't feel guilty or, you know, get this kind of job or like change your healthcare plan or all of these things, that's way easier than changing institutions. Historically, we know that structural change is the hardest change. That's why we have women who are working full time and then working full time after they get home because the institutions didn't change when the women entered the workforce. You know, Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote that piece, I think in the Atlantic, women can't have it all. And people were so mad. But she wasn't saying that women shouldn't try. She was saying there was no institutional change to support the generational shift of women entering the workforce in the 1970s in astronomically higher numbers, that none of the other institutions were changing. And I think as women are transitioning back to work, if they're lucky enough, if the jobs are still there after the pandemic, that we can't forget some of the ways that we operated to allow people to work in different ways. Like for me at this point in my life, when I have two young kids, you know, I need to be home at a cer certain time that online teaching has really worked out well for me. I can work at night or I can log in to meetings. And there's some really great things that have come out of this for, for certain populations, not for all. And so I, I hope that we don't lose that momentum when we go back. But I can already tell that my university is cutting back on online teaching. 
they're saying everybody needs to be back in the office. You can have office hours on campus. You can't do Zoom office hours, all these things that are just a reminder to me that nobody cares that I have children, that I'm you know, also doing this job and being a mother, that my schedule is supposed to be modeled after a nine to five, which is very patriarchal. Hmm. Well, you guys, I mean, you've given us so many thought provoking things. And I, of course, I recommend that everybody read You're Doing It Wrong, Mothering Media and Medical Expertise, because I didn't know this stuff until I started researching you guys and having this conversation in terms of all of the historical and cultural and societal things that are at play to keep women feeling guilty. And so, you know, in some ways you have no choice but to be in this construct. You guys are so helpful. And I would love to be able to circle back with you whenever we have, you know, issues for CNN or the podcast or whatever, because you guys know so much about it. We'd love to talk to you. And thank you for all you're doing to fight for women's rights and for being out there. You know, you're modeling that there are ways to do this and you're being open about having those conversations and reflecting on your own life, which is why this is fun. Yes, your kids are so lucky to have you. Thank you. Well, I admit that did change my perspective. I don't reject the mom guilt as outright as I did before talking to them because now I see more the forces at play that have conspired to make women feel this way. And I just, I really hope though that understanding that, that some of you listening will be able to shake off some of the mom guilt. You know, it's it's not just decisions you're making. It's kind of, as they described, society as a whole, it's gone on for generations. And I hope that that awareness helps everyone just feel less pressure about all of it. Thanks again for listening. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Email connect at distractionpodcast.com. I'm Allison Camerata. Really appreciate you being here as part of this distraction community. Distraction is created by Sounds Great Media. Our producer is Sarah Gurton. And special thanks to Emma Marshall, Melissa Blum, and Caitlin Goldsmith. The episode you just heard was made possible by our sponsor, Landmark College, the college for students who learn differently, offering comprehensive supports for students with ADHD and other learning differences, both on campus and online. Learn more at lcdistraction.org.